Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Faculty Public Affairs Research Series. Uh, today's event is Border Blues, where we're going to be taking a look at some of the stuff that we haven't been hearing as much about over the past what now year and nine months or so. Yes, the border opened yesterday, but uh, it's not really that open. And I think our speakers will speak to the challenges that continue uh, as as we go on through this pandemic. Uh, we have three speakers today, but before I introduce them, I want to first acknowledge that uh, this event is hosted by Carleton University, which is located in the unceded, unceded Algonquin territory, which is home to Anishinaabe Nation. Uh, we are going to have uh, three speakers today, Laura Truesdale, Truesdale, who is the Assistant Director at International Studies Services and Student Life at Carleton. Uh, she currently oversees a variety of international focused portfolios on campus, including immigration advising. Uh, before she joined Carleton, she worked uh, as an RCIC in law firms supporting various immigration processes. Paul McKenzie Jones is a settler associate professor of indigenous studies at the University of Lethbridge and an external research affiliate with the Puree Global Indigenous and Diaspora Research Center at the University of Newcastle, Australia. His current research focuses on indigenous intellectual and cultural erasure of imposed settler colonial borders. Uh, our third speaker is Harmit Sarai. She's a lawyer at Haran Law Offices. She practices immigration, refugee, and citizenship law. Uh, her practice involves pro bono work as a board member of the South Asian Legal Clinic of British Columbia and a volunteer lawyer with Canadian Lawyers for International Human Rights. Um, she received her JD from the University of Saskatchewan and was called to the bar of British Columbia in, uh, just last year. So uh, those are our speakers and uh, we'll get started with Laura, please. The floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me. My name is Laura Trusdell and I manage the International Student Services Office here at Carleton University. I wanna take the time to discuss how COVID-19 and the border closures have had real impacts on in the international student experience. While every student will have a unique set of circumstances, our office, like many who focus on international student support, have seen some emerging commonalities in the types of inquiries that we're receiving during this complex time. So to give some context for the impacts to international students, I wanna briefly highlight some of the expectations from local, provincial, and federal governments that universities and colleges as designated learning institutions or DLIs as we're commonly referred to, have had to navigate in order to be approved to welcome international students. While it may seem like a lifetime ago, you can cast your mind back to early 2020, the world was quite uncertain as to what we were facing. But those of us with responsibilities for all things international really braced for a wave of unprecedented changes that we knew were coming that would impact our communities. While the majority of what we're gonna focus on today will of course be the impacts of the Canadian border closure, it bears noting that this was not the only frontier that international students were navigating. Many international students within Canada were stranded here as a result of their own country's border restrictions, um, some even before Canada's measures were announced. Universities and colleges were scrambling to accommodate these students beyond the winter term and diligently making sure that they were abiding by their own country's border restrictions as well prior to making travel plans. During the summer of 2020, DLIs were tasked with putting together COVID-19 readiness plans that would demonstrate our ability to welcome international students safely to Canada, Ontario, and our campus community. It had to cover everything from pre-arrival information and supports to assistance with mandatory quarantine, compliance with immigration and public health measures, including COVID testing, um, a process for reporting symptomatic cases, mental health supports, and a whole other host of requirements as well. Once compiled, uh, our plan had to be reviewed and approved by local health units and the provincial and federal government bodies. In the International Student Services Office here at Carleton, we built out a robust pre-arrival and arrival supports for students, and we're proud to be one of the first institutions approved in October 2020 to welcome international students to Canada under this new challenging landscape. Well, this cleared one huge hurdle for international students, many other challenges continued to present themselves as a result of the border closure. And they continue to be felt by each new cohort of students that we're welcoming to our campuses. Some of these are unique to the COVID landscape and others were longer standing pressure points 
uh, that have been exacerbated by the impacts of COVID-19. For many students, they struggled with not understanding the short and long-term impacts of their immigration status in this new landscape. While this isn't new, students often struggle to understand the nuance of their student status working in Canada and post-graduation plans with COVID-19 and the almost weekly updates to program delivery instructions, students and practitioners alike were left feeling as though the expectations were either unclear or missing very key information. Now it seemed like every student email coming into our inbox was very, very complex. Once students found the right place on the IRCC website to get the information that they were looking for, they often struggled with how it applied to their particular circumstance, very often falling into the trap of relying on bad advice that they had received from family and friends and other community members. For example, many students studying outside of Canada just simply did not apply for a study permit or let their status lapse while they were outside of the country. While this was permissible for them to continue with their online studies, it certainly posed a challenge when students were ready to return to Canada and or when they are looking ahead at applying for a postgraduate work permit and finding out that they may no longer be eligible. This is just one example of the many considerations that IRCC and CBSA both collectively simply felt students should know how to magically navigate and our office is still helping students navigate many of these pressure points on a daily basis. Air travel has also become a pressure point for international students that is really unique to this COVID landscape. Early on, information was changing and evolving so rapidly that the entry requirements to Canada could literally change while a student was in the air en route. Then came flight bans from Pakistan, India, and Morocco with students waiting with huge uncertainty when these would be lifted or devising complex and often very complex and costly alternative routes. The role that airlines have played during COVID-19 has been challenging in terms of offering student support. Airlines effectively became the first port of entry. And while of course airlines have always reviewed immigration documentation prior to boarding during COVID, uh, they seemed a lot more emboldened to take on the role of IRCC, CBSA and public health officer. They would decide if a student was a genuine student a traveling for an essential purpose, they would look at whether the student had enough funds for their stay, and they would look at a whole host of documentation typically reserved for CBSA at a port of entry. When it comes to finances, being an international student is already a pretty expensive undertaking, and it just became a whole lot more costly due to COVID-19. Flight costs soared, quarantine costs could be upward of four or 5,000 additional dollars, depending on if you were going through the government hotel process, this, pro this cost could even jump further. You were looking at PCR testing, a whole host of other unrelated costs due to your international student status and experience. This is wrapped in with, of course, economies around the world have struggled to adapt to COVID-19 and students would write to us that their parents had lost their jobs or lost their business as a result of COVID and students and their families were uncertain how they were going to make ends meet. Students studying online from their home country were also navigating unfavorable time zones and they would have to choose whether to take that job or whether to study online at the appropriate time during their classes, oftentimes having to prioritize work over sleep or vice versa. While finances are often a difficult subject for international students, COVID-19 really highlighted the economic challenges around the globe and how interconnected these are to the international student experience. And it'll take some time to rebuild and reestablish these financial pathways for students as well. And then when we look at the academic experience as a result of the border closure, as many of you can appreciate studying online as a science and certainly not for everyone. Now imagine that you're an international student studying online from your home country with an eight hour time difference from your classmates. Perhaps this is the first time that you're studying in English, attending lectures, keeping up with readings and making time for group work are all now significant challenges in your student experience. International students are often shifting their sleep schedules to accommodate course requirements and sometimes even doing away with sleep altogether to ensure that they maintain their degree requirements and progression. They also struggled with the types of classes that they could take from their home country, navigating issues such as technology and censorship. 
further studying certain types of topics in their family home could leave them open to some very difficult conversations with their parents. For example, a gender studies course uh, with lectures and readings that had content that was considered taboo or even illegal in their home country was a challenge when students are studying from their family home at their dining room table within earshot of their parents and grandparents. International students also had to contend with challenges and unforeseen events in their home country that could prevent online study from being a success for them. For example, students had to contend with rolling blackouts and electricity deficiencies, natural disasters such as hurricanes and typhoons. Um, and then we even heard of cases where students were being uh, extorted by local gangs as they were perceived to have wealth given that they were pursuing their education at a university abroad. As a result, many students had to carefully construct their class schedules in order to give them the best chance of success, really having impacts on their degree sequencing and overall progression within their program. And then we look at mental health and accessing support while students are outside of Canada. The ability to access these supports uh, were a considerable struggle for many international students. For many students, even the discussion of mental health within their culture and family could be seen as taboo. Further, when students were finally able to articulate their comfort in seeking out mental health supports from overseas, the options were incredibly limited to them. Universities could offer virtual supports, uh, which was a preference for some, uh, but most really craved that in-person connection that they were lacking in order to discuss what was happening in their current circumstances. Being stuck outside of Canada was a real burden and barrier for students when it came to their mental health. And when you look more broadly at a student's support network, you would think that in an era of social media, that students would feel right at home living their lives in virtual spaces. But unfortunately, this was not the case, particularly for international students. Uh, so much of their cultural learning comes from immersing themselves in a new society. And this connection was noticeably absent and unable to be recreated in a virtual environment. Parents also struggled with the anxiety of sending their children off to Canada, often alone for the very first time. For students, particularly in their first year, having their families with them can be a real source of comfort as they navigate those first couple weeks as they transition to life in Canada. Further, students at the end of their studies graduating and not being able to celebrate this achievement with their family was a real source of a, a mental health struggle for students as they were unable to really celebrate the achievements that they've undertaken over the past many years. Restricting travel of the wider family network of international students really did contribute to overall mental health concerns within this population during the pandemic. And I'd like to just conclude by briefly touching on vaccination and looking to the future. So as we look to the future, it does bear noting that the impacts of COVID-19 will continue to be felt by international students for years to come. Even if the pandemic miraculously ended tomorrow, international students will have to interpret their study, compliance with terms and conditions, and future applications and measures in place at the time in question. So for example, students applying for a postgraduate work permit will have to rely on much more robust documentation to explain their particular academic journey and how it aligns with the various COVID measures that were in place at the time that they were studying. Additionally, now that travel to Canada has begun to reopen, vaccination status is looking to be potentially more of a border restriction than the annual border restriction measure to date. This will be an and their families from select regions with low vaccine rollout rates or that have a vaccine widely available that isn't approved in Canada. There's still a lot that needs to be done in this space and looking at impacts of COVID-19 through our Canadian-centric lens where we have very high vaccine uptake and very limited restrictions will only disadvantage our international student population. So really, what can we hope for? We can really hope for clear communication from IRCC, CBSA, and other partners in the international student space. Uh, this may seem rather obvious, but information and guidance for international students needs to be accessible and recognize that students invest a lot in our society, our economy, and enrich our Canadian culture through their countless contributions during their time in Canada. They have been and continue to be 
impacted by these incredibly complex and challenging times and compassion in decision making at the port of entry and by immigration officials can truly go a long way in this space. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, Paul? Yeah, uh, thank you. And, and I want to um, say especially thank you to Paxton for inviting me. And I know it wasn't just your decision, but you're the one who reached out. So I really do appreciate the invitation to speak today. Um, I have a slide that I wanted to share, just looking at the impact of the, the closure on Indigenous peoples. And on KW. I think many people are. Uh, I'd be surprised how many people are actually aware that so many uh, indigenous nations are still, you know, quite so uh, close to the to the border. And this map again, you know, this is this is you know, um, as Laura just talked about the Canadian centric view. This is the same. The map doesn't do the opposite side of the border. It's just got the Canadian. But you know, as we are here, I figured that's where we would, you know, I would use this map. And I was thinking about how to to start the talk, and I think I finally decided on to focus on land acknowledgements. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a starting point. And most, <clears throat> excuse me, institutional formal acknowledgements are, I would argue, are fundamentally inadequate and sort of flawed in the fact that they focus on the specific place being acknowledged. For example, in my university acknowledges being on Blackfoot territory, but very specifically in the framework of Treaty 7. You know, so it's very much, again, it's that Canadian centric viewpoint of and especially sort of Alberta viewpoint of the um, you know the territory that we that we are on, but then if you speak to um, a Blackfoot elder, you know, and there immediately will give you the fuller version of the territory, you know, all the way up to what's now Edmonton, all the way down to what's you know, now um, Wyoming, uh, you know, all the way to the, the Rocky Mountains in the west and beyond the Cypress Hills into what's Saskatchewan. So we've got two nations, two provinces. Um, and, and the US, two US states, because we've gone right through Montana, all included in this territory. And yet the land acknowledgement uh, focuses, well, here focuses on, you know, specifically Treaty 7. And so, you know, even before COVID, the border is an issue. And there are multiple subtle variations of the border imposed before we even get, you know, before I even get to the border closure. There's conceptualizations of location, there's conceptualizations of terminology from the different borders. And yet, in all of this, indigenous nations did and still do consider themselves sovereign nations with control over their own culture, their own territory. Um, they have their own systems of government, land and resource management, including the rights to that land and resource, um, including, again, so the, going from the Canadian perspective, what's now across the border into the United States. So one of the first contrasts Sort of to be drawn between pre-border and I say post-border, but was really it's the it's the border, so pre-border and border era, which can also be extrapolated into sort of the pre and post-COVID closure, is when you speak to Indigenous people um, <clears throat> in locations such as this, and obviously sort of you know the Ontario as well. Um, there was a, a there was such a freedom of movement between territories between you know what's now considered the U.S. border, which was conceptualized at one point as the medicine land because it protected that freedom of of movement. That you know, and that freedom of movement is epitomized by you know sustaining livelihood, choosing sites for families to live on, journeying to ceremony, sacred sites. Um, some of the sacred sites are on the United States side, so people traveling south. And then there's the Canadian side and people traveling north. And you know, so the border, even before, again, before we sort of, you know, well, not before we get to COVID, but also I suppose during the COVID closure, is the effect that the, that the border has on um, culture and family and land. And I've got a visualization of contrast of this is Waterton Park, which is uh, an international lake in Alberta. And this is again, it was all Blackfoot territory. And you can see sort of you know, the natural boundaries of the mountains through the water. Um, the sort of this man-made section of the US border where it's just the trees are mowed down to mark this specific line. If you go all the way through, there are obelixes um, peppered all the way through this line to mark the, the US border. Um, during COVID, this is literally, you know, normally you can go all the way to the other side. Um, you can go into Montana, there's a at the base of a mountain, there's a little park ranger um, hut, which 
constitutes a border crossing and you can go in, um, you know, people go to hike, et cetera. During COVID, you literally got stopped halfway at the river and you had halfway during the, the lake rather, and then turn around and come back. And so this is, a, you know, this is as a settler, I experienced that, but again, I'm just doing this as a, was, was on it for a research point, to prove a point for research. Um, but that extrapolates into this COVID closure, stopping indigenous people getting to their, their sacred sites um, because cer ceremony is not considered an essential travel. Um, the, one of the examples of this was uh, is Chief Mountain, which is a sacred mountain. Now, and this is really where the, 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 all this relates to the COVID border closure. Um, you know, border closure immediately reasserted travel, travel restrictions for indigenous people uh, that a couple of elders expressed to me are very similar to the past system that was in place in the early 1900s, late 1800s of that you cannot, lower, you, you, you're not allowed to leave. You cannot pass from reserve to reserve. And they said it felt the same now that, you know, Chief Mountain is something that uh, several elders have said, every Blackfoot person, at some point we'll have a relationship with this mountain. It's one of the most sacred mountains. But now um, people can't get to it. You know, and this is again a picture of, uh, I took to sort of prove a point of, of you know, this is the border. Um, it wasn't deliberately hazy, Chief Mountain in the background there, it's just the, the day I took this, we were full of smoke from the, the um, BC and Saskatchewan fires, but I think it, it's such a strong representation of, of how out of reach such an important site is um, during the COVID closure. And it disrupts, you know, uh, so many cases of, of just simple access to ceremony, being access to prayer, which many of us, for those of us who are religious, we still are able during COVID to go to our places of worship, you know, whether that be a mosque, a synagogue, a church, um, et cetera. There's still, you know, there was so much shut down all the restrictions in certain places, you know, only 15 people allowed or 15% and so on and so forth, but for the most part, still accessible. Um, and yet here is one of the most sacred sites completely you know, unavailable because of the border closing down. And which is also seen as an infringement on sovereignty. You know, if you've got this territorial sovereignty um, and yet here's the settler government saying this, this line cannot be crossed, you cannot travel on your own territories. And so there was a federal report published in February of this year. And <clears throat> so what we had, Indigenous Peoples in COVID. So this is a public health report, um, the Public Health Agency of Canada. And one of the biggest frustrations from Indigenous communities was the lack of consultation over the initial closure and then any potential reopenings. It, because the reopenings potentially affect uh, people coming into reserve to coming into territories possibly that this is in February. So we now know, you know that the restrictions are in place for people coming back into the country as of yesterday. But the conversations happening in February, indigenous people weren't given a clear idea of what that border reopening would look like. There was no consultation for them. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, the federal government, the, the argument was being made that all border communities should be should be having these conversations with the federal government. The federal government should be you know, talking to all people. Um, and so one of the other frustrations is that there was no formal approach to indigenous peoples all the way across the board. And some of this came back to the idea of the, the issues of location and geography. Because we've got some indigenous um, communities whose land still you know, crosses the border or the border crosses their land. Um, and in one such, so the, the government ended up with a sort of ad hoc um, approach to indigenous territory, where in almost all cases, the border lockdown is formally in place, but in some rare instances, the border restriction is lifted. So, you know, Anamaki Wazing uh, is one of those reserves. So you've got the sort of the, the, there's a part of the reserve called Windigo Island. And in order to leave Windigo Island, you have to take a boat that crosses into Minnesota. And once you're in Minnesota, you can then have the only roads available to get back 
into Canada in order for grocery shopping and so on and so forth. So during the COVID lockdown, residents on Windigal Island were required simply give, give a phone call to the border agents to let them know you're coming across. Um, and that's all you need to do. There were multiple complaints of harassment um, you know, by either border agents um, trying to tell people that they were not allowed to go across, even though it's literally the only way they could get food. And this is why the, you know, the, the, the agreement was reached. There were instances of people going across going back into Canada. So literally the only access they had, the, literally the only thing they did in the United States was get into a car and you know, drive back into Canada. But the, immediately they were back into Canada, they started getting those phone calls. You need to quarantine, you need to quarantine for 14 days if you've not been tested. And so the, you're gonna get fined if you don't quarantine for 14 days. And so these complaints have been made. And of course the, you know, the, the government says that well, we're not going to talk about specific cases, so we've only got one side of the, <laughs> you know, the, of, of the conversation here. But this is a this is a constant. You know, we have this arrangement, but we every time we go to buy our shops, once a week, once a month, we immediately start getting these phone calls from Health Canada, um, threatening us with fines if we don't isolate, even though we're not required to isolate. So, one of the other recommendations the report made was that provincial and territorial governments should be working with indigenous communities regarding border openings. And <clears throat> you know, there, there are problems with that in the case, in, in many cases, it seems as if the, the, the federal government was uh, sort of passing along, passing the book slightly, you know, sort of allowing somebody else to take control of something they should have been in control of. But then when you think of Aquas Arsene, it becomes even more complicated because which provincial or territorial government works work. So this, this, this one community, this one reserve, uh, Canada, the United States, New York, Ontario, Quebec, all claim some form of jurisdictional oversight. So there are, you know, again, re returning to the, the, the geographical issues with the border, uh, there are multiple competing uh, claims of jurisdiction in multiple locations. So the potential there is for one agreement to be made in one place that doesn't necessarily um, you know, equate to a different place on the same reserve. Um, and you can see, so, you know, just from, from the map, how how uh, complex Akwazasne is as a, um, you know, and there's a long history of border issues on Cornwall Island, especially as well, which is a, a, a different conversation. So the Mohawk Council here came to an agreement with Canada where they could travel 160 kilometers from their homes again, without needing to quarantine upon return. But because the territory crosses the border or the border crosses the territory, there were different, there were competing mask rules depending on what state or what country you, or what province you were in. Um, there were other issues of, of the reasons for this agreement being reached, not being properly conveyed to the general public. So there's, harassment from non-indigenous people, angry at the closure and indignant of what seems to be a free pass for the Mohawk uh, who could cross the border. Uh, there's still issues of harassment from border agents who are drafted in from different locations and not being brought fully up to speed as to why this arrangement exists. Um, you know, the complication of the fact that many residents within Akwazasne are dual citizens. So they've got, they are triple citizens if you include their Mohawk um, citizenship, so I apologize. Um, so they've got triple citizenship, primarily in the case of the border, you know, the dual US and Canadian. So there's multiple, multiple complications here that never really got resolved and just created in mass confusion, uh, not just for the indigenous community, but for uh, people around which created you know, aggression and resentment towards them, which, if we're going to be honest, already exists on, a, on you know, even in the present day that it, it shouldn't do. So, you know, we've got four different, we've got conflicting rules within Canada for different Indigenous communities based on current understandings of the, of the you know, the territory, which sort of takes me all the way back to the, the first comment about land acknowledgements. You know, you, you, you sort of, the traditional Blackfoot territory crosses the border 
well, it's not logistically the same as Aquasasni, which is still in its present form intact on both sides of the border. So the government takes this sort of you know, different approach to it, but then indigenous people themselves are looking across the country and saying, well, you know, if it's okay for them, why can't you come to the same you know, come to the same arrangements for us? You know, or at least why can't we go to somewhere like Chief Mountain just to, you know, just for ceremony? Um, and then you've got to sort of depend on which side of the border people find themselves. You've got all these multiple competing assertions of sovereignty. And so you know, it, I wanted to sort of keep it short because I know we, we were talking about sort of 10, 12 minutes. And I'm not sure how much time I've used so far. But to sort of wrap it up, in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this confusion, there's a 10 year court case going on about uh, territorial sovereignty. And it was resolved on April the 23rd at the Supreme Court of Canada. And so the Supreme Court, this is a, a, a Sanite gentleman who hunted in um, Canada and was arrested for, uh, you know, because he's a US citizen, he was arrested and charged with, you know, poaching and trespass. And, and so he's been fighting this for 10 years. Uh, <clears throat> Supreme Court decided, the Canadian Supreme Court ruled in April, that indigenous people from within the US whose traditional territory straddles the international border are free to exercise indigenous rights in Canada under section 35.1 of the constitution, even if they're not citizens of Canada or even reside in Canada. So in the midst of this border closure, while well, causing all these additional issues for um, indigenous peoples, the Supreme Court says, even if you are no longer, even if you are, if your traditional territory was here, and it's sort of ironic in the case that the Canadian government classifies the Sanite as being extinct. So they're recognized in the US, but not actually legally recognized in Canada. And that's a whole different fight that's still going on. But as a Sanite um, who's, who's of the Lakes nation, who was classified as because he's of the Lakes and they are descendant nation of the Sanite, then therefore he, he constitutionally has a ancestral right to that territory being told he you know yeah after 10 years you are free to exercise this 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 indigenous rights so it complicates our understanding of the border um at a time when the borders closed and i would have argued that this then it's probably the closest the, the canadian government's ever got or the supreme court has ever got to affirm in the jay treaty you know even implicitly if not explicitly um and I would have argued that, they, well, I do argue that this could and should have resulted in a more equitable relaxing of border cl closures for all border adjacent indigenous communities. And once this ruling is in place, then, okay, let's look at all of these nations, not just the Blackfoot, but the, you know, the Potawatomi, the Cree, the, the, so many Anishinaabe nations who, who crisscross the, 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 um, the border and see if we cannot come to a similar arrangement that we have with the Mohawk, that we have with, um, you know, the Anamaki. And, and it didn't. Um, now, why it means for indigenous people in the post COVID closure world, um, we'll have to wait and see, but it, 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 it further complicates an already complex and complicated issue with the, the the border as it stands and as we you know all acknowledge the border reopened yesterday but still now um the prohibited cost of the of the test you need to get back into canada is still going to restrict many indigenous people from being able to get back to those sites that they've been you know stopped from visiting for the past um, you know months while while the border was closed so uh, yeah thank you Thank you very much. Uh, and our third speaker is Ramit. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Great, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, I'd like to focus my presentation on discussing how the border closures due to the global pandemic have uh, affected international students, those who had applied for their permanent residence, families and spouses. So just going back to pre-pandemic, um, in 2019, Canada had welcomed the highest number of new immigrants in more than a century, opening its doors to over 340,000 people. 
And then in early 2020, before March, Canada was set to welcome more than 1 million new immigrants as permanent residents over the next three years. And then of course, due to the pandemic, the reality was that in 2020, Canada only welcomed about 184,000 new immigrants, down by almost half from 2019. So as soon as COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic, the prime minister announced that beginning March 18th, 2020, the federal government was closing the border except to Canadian citizens, permanent residents and Americans. The immediate border closure caused many issues. For instance, there was a story published in the Toronto Star where a nanny um, carrying a foreign non-Canadian passport had traveled to Mexico with her Canadian employer, but due to the Canadian border being closed and her being a foreign national, the nanny could not return to Canada with her employer. So temporary residents, such as those with valid work and student visas were not exempt and many temporary residents were stranded overseas and banned from re-entering Canada. So in a sense, um, you can say that initially the border closure measures definitely overlook the interests of the country's temporary residents. Um, however, not long after the prime minister announced that the government would restrict non-essential travel between Canada and the US and those exempt included um, truck drivers, healthcare providers, airline crews and infrastructure workers. The government also relaxed um, their travel rules to provide exemptions to migrant farm workers, fish, seafood workers and other temporary foreign workers. So as you can see, the federal government eventually recognized that foreign workers were vital to the Canadian e economy, including food security for Canadians. I just want to move on to firstly talk about how international students were impacted by border closures during the pandemic. Um, it's important to note that, like as Laura had mentioned, that it wasn't just the Canadian borders that were restricting international students from coming to Canada. It was also border restrictions from the student's home country that impacted travel. There were also flight cancellations um, and closed language testing sites and closed visa officers, which posed major challenges for students um, in their home countries. Um, and as some of you are probably aware, those who graduate from a Canadian college or university are granted what's called a postgraduate work permit that lasts between one and three years, um, depending on the duration um, of their academic programs. And it's important to emphasize that many international students count on postgraduate work permits. Um, as an ultimate pathway for permanent residents, as it gives them the opportunity to get that one year of Canadian work experience um, that is required to get PR under the Canadian um, experience class dream. And due to the pandemic travel restrictions, um, the federal government announced in February of this year that international students um, would be able to complete their entire studies online from abroad and these studies completed outside Canada would still count towards eligibility for a future postgraduate work permit in Canada. Although this was an important measure and eased the worries um, of many students overseas who were completing their studies online and abroad, uh, many international students who graduated from their program and were in Canada expressed that they were struggling to find their first job. Um, especially jobs that were managerial and skilled professional levels, um, which is a requirement um, to be eligible to the Canadian Express, um, uh, the Canadian Experience class stream. For others, they were uh, laid off during the pandemic and also faced their own set of challenges in securing new employment. For example, employers were not looking to hire someone with a work permit that was going to expire in say four months. Um, some students decided it was best to delay applying for their postgraduate work permit because they didn't have a job lined up. So they decided to take more courses or enroll in another program to buy themselves more time essentially. But those who didn't have that luxury of applying to another program due to financial struggles, going back to school was not an option. Um, many international students also expressed that they were competing for jobs with Canadians and so those people who had already some work experience in Canada and which some would argue look more favorable for employers. Um, 
Fortunately, the federal government did recognize some of these issues of international students not being able to find meaningful jobs or being laid off um, during the pandemic and not being able to qualify for PR. So in January of this year, the federal government launched a temporary um, policy to allow international students with an expired or expiring postgraduate um, work permit to apply for a new permit that would be valid for up to 18 months. Um, to be considered under this public policy, among other requirements, applications must have been submitted between January 27th um, of this year and July 27th of this year. So I would say currently the downside is that international students are no longer able to apply for this um, extension, despite COVID still being a real uh, thing and lack of employment opportunities still being an issue for many. Um, in April of this year, Canada declared a new one-time special program that would open its doors to permanent residents for 40,000 um, international students. International students would qualify for the new program if they had graduated from an eligible um, post-secondary program within the past four years after January 2017 and if they were currently employed. The key thing um, here was that they did not need to be in a specific occupation to meet the requirements. So as you can imagine, this program generated a great amount of interest. Um, however, one of the issues um, that arose with this program was that in order to qualify, the applicants um, must meet the language proficiency requirement. And so with all of this interest, it was a struggle for people to get um, a date for the language test. The cap of 40,000 um, for the international graduate stream was actually met within 26 hours after applications had opened on May 6th, May 6th of this year. So again, the downside is that this program is no longer available to those still struggling to find meaningful work that would allow them to meet the requirements to then apply for their PR. So currently, um, international students studying abroad, online abroad, may be authorized to um, enter Canada to attend in-person classes if the school is included on the list of designated learning institutions um, with an approved COVID-19 readiness plan in place. Um, it's important to keep in mind that boarded, border agents um, do have the authority to assess and reviews at the port of entry. Um, they have the authority to make those calls. Um, I also wanted to briefly touch on those individuals who had a permanent resident visa issued to them to settle in Canada um, permanently. So those with their visa stamped after March 18th, 2020, after the Canadian borders closed, um, new, new policy required them to apply for an authorization to travel before they could board a flight unless they were coming from the US. And so the issue with needing to apply for authorization and waiting to hear back meant that for many, their visas had expired. Also, it wasn't until July 2020, four months later, did officials introduce a web form for expired visa holders to apply for an authorization letter and be assessed by a list of criteria, including whether they had compelling reason to travel to Canada. Even with the authorization letter, Canada border, border agents still had the final say at ports of entry. Um, the worst part of this was that many were not expecting the border closures. And so these newcomers had sold their homes, their jobs, pulled their kids out of school, um, bought plane tickets, only to have the borders closed with no communication from the government for months as to when they would be able to come to Canada. Um, this is an example of how the government was not adequately prepared for the circumstances the pandemic brought on. Perhaps a possible solution could have been for the government to honor expired permanent resident visas and let them into the country provided they abide by public health rules. However, at the same time, IRCC also needed to do an admissibility checks again, like criminal records for certain individuals because quite a bit of time had elapsed since the expiration of their visas. I'd like to move on to discussing travel restrictions for immediate family members of Canadian citizens and permanent residents 
and spousal sponsorship files. So when the prime minister first announced the border would be closed to non-Canadians, non he made exceptions for immediate family members of Canadian citizens and permanent residents. What was not made very clear by the government was that foreign nationals married to Canadians could and would be refused at the border if their travels were deemed non-essential and optional, such as tourism, visiting, recreation or entertainment. This became an unexpected reality for many couples who were not prepared for this physical separation from their partners. Currently, despite it being 20, mo 20 months since the border closures were first announced, there are still many Canadians separated from their foreign national spouses due to border closings and a backlog on processing spousal sponsorship files. Spousal sponsorship applications um, do take an average processing time of 12 months, but during the pandemic, many foreign partners have had to wait overseas for as long as two years or more since pre-pandemic to receive feedback on their application. And while foreign spouses from visa exempt countries like the US or the UK could enter Canada to visit their Canadian partners while they wait for their spousal sponsorship applications to be processed, this was not the case for many others. Foreign spouses who are nationals of visa required countries are required to make another application for a visitor visa, also known as temporary resident visa, simply to enter Canada to visit their spouse. Um, and officers often deny visitor visas to people with family in Canada because they believe the applicant's ties to Canada are too strong that they will overstay their visa. Perhaps in, un perhaps in unprecedented the times like these, the government could create a special temporary resident visa for outland applicants with reasonable eligibility criteria and conditions, um, which would allow spouses and their children from visa required countries to easily apply for the special temporary resident visa online and not be refused simply because they have loved ones in Canada. Um, in terms of the future, according to government plans, um, Canada will welcome more than 1.2 new immigrants over the next three years, with an annual intake that would reach 401,000 this year, 411,000 in 2022, and 421,000 in 2021. Um, for me, this really begs the question, what will happen to the backlog of spousal sponsorship applications, permanent resident applications, the backlog of study permit applications waiting to be processed, um, it will still take time to increase the flow of new immigrants back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, I think it would really help if the government was more transparent with their plans going forward so that individuals, spouses, families can plan for their future and not have their lives on standstill, which has been the case for many. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the three presentations. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, and then we'll, we'll ask those in the audience to ask questions as well. I, I, for the three of you, I'm, I'm curious about um, two things. Uh, there are some themes that came across many of the Oh, many uh, uh, across the presentations. Uh, so I guess the first thing is, is over the course of the 20 months or so, did you see significant change and learning on part of the government? So that's part A. And part B, was there learning on the part of those that were dealing with the government where they found it, uh, did they find strategies to be able to lobby the government to push it to change its policies? So how sticky was the government that they learn? And was there any ability on the part of those who are impacted by these things to push the government uh, to, to uh, modify or creatively interpret uh, the policy so that way they'd be less harmful? And we might as well go in the order that people present. So Laura, Paul, and then Harmit. Sure. Um... I'm not sure how much learning has happened from the government in terms of international student. 
uh, support. I would say that largely they have been reactionary in this space and those who navigate the immigration landscape for a living would not be surprised <laughs> by this. There's not a lot of proactivity in this space. Um, but I, I do think that um, there has been some learning from the government on the fly. And I think where international students maybe differ from that of the other categories of immigrants coming to Canada is the financial element that they bring. And so I think there was probably um, more of a lobbying effort to kind of speak to point B uh, that could be done from established international groups such as the Canadian Bureau for International Education, such as Universities Canada, such as colleges in Canada International, that were very well established groups that had um, well trained ears to government contacts that could put forward strong financial arguments as to why the government needed to be more flexible for international students in this space. And I'm not confident that, but for that financial argument, there would have been as much movement in the international student space. And I think we see that reflected in how other categories of immigrants and border crossers have been treated throughout this pandemic. Thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, in terms of the, government learning in terms of public health policy on indigenous communities there seems to have been a lot of they were finally acknowledging that indigenous communities know how to look after themselves if given access to resources um so there's been you know and there's been a lot of um and that, and that same report sort of acknowledges that there's been a lot of um growth in the public health relationship to i mean there's still problems um you know that are never going to get fixed until we address issues like clean water but in terms of, of giving nations and communities access to the resources they need you know not creating issues when they close their own borders you know then the, there's been growth there from from both sides in terms of the relationship when it comes to the border itself though no um and this is something that's been a uh, you know and, and a sort of a side of sort of separate or maybe part of the larger research project and talking to to elders and former um you know chief and council members um the complaint is that when it comes to just general border crossing issues that have been going on for you know, and there are multiple reports of these, you know, there are multiple other reports of, of, of um, you know, indigenous issues with the federal border crossing system. Um, the argument is every time there's a new government, a new tribal government, a new indigenous government, um, you know, the, the federal government takes it as a reset. Uh, oh, we've got to start negotiations all over again. Every time there's a new federal government, oh, we've got to start negotiations all over again. And so even basics such as, you know, um, more cultural understanding of of the significance of, of medicine bundles and the reasons why random border agents shouldn't be opening them up and picking them and accusing people of using them to smuggle drugs even small things like that get lost and so while covid was or while this as the pandemic has been a perfect time with the border being closed for a reset in that relationship um you know the 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 fact that they're still complaining there's no consultation over the board itself suggests that, that was the government in that instance has not really learned or made any desire to, to, to approach it any differently than the constant promises of, that were already there beforehand. So, um, yeah, whether, whether that changes again in the future, uh, I'm, I'm not really uh, too confident, but you, you, know, you never know, I suppose. And just a follow up before we move on to Hamid, which is Laura addressed the money situation that that international students have some influence because they have they bring in money, they're a source of income, and universities have become much more dependent over the past uh, twenty years on foreign tuition. Although our our provincial leadership often forgets this, um, so I guess Paul, the question is um, not so much money, but are there ways in which uh, indigenous communities have any kind of lobbying power or is this just something that has always been a real problem and their agenda the, the problems are so stark and, and broad and deep that 
that they, they just can't uh, push either provincial or or or, or nation uh, countries to move very far uh, on this. Uh, in, I mean, the, the stories you gave of, of communities that are split across the border, you know, obviously they're they're impacted very very strongly, but we haven't really heard much about it. And so, uh, I'm I'm just curious as to what whether they, they they can lobby and whether lobbying efforts are just just and not, there's just no way that they can move the the needle on this. Uh. The, the much of it is optics. I think that the, the say so, so, locally the, the 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 Guyanai nation or blood reserve has a lot of um, uh, I would say power, but optically within the university there's a lot of influence within the university. But then when it comes to the federal government uh, or even the provincial government, uh, it, it, it's constantly you know. It's met, it falls on deaf ears, and yeah. it quite often uh, there's a there's a um, a scholar out at UBC, um, Cheryl Lifefoot, who is uh, mm -hmm. she she works with you know, she works in the UN. She was you know, embedded in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and um, you know she calls it colonial shifting, um, where the the lobbying from Indigenous peoples will result in minor changes. Mm -hmm. but those minor changes are presented as big changes, but in, um, implemented in ways that actually quite often end up being even worse for the indigenous community than the original place they started. Mm -hmm. so there's this constant shift in the goalposts. And so, you know, we see sort of, if you, if you take the TRC and the, 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 you know, all the recommendations made there, and we're still in a process of, well, we have these, we're going to set up a panel or we're going to set up an investigation or we're going to set up. And then when that investigation or that panel comes to its, to its uh, conclusions, another panel is then set up to investigate those conclusions. And so nothing is ever actually implemented, but the government and the deal you know, is the same. And then our current um, the political climate in Alberta, uh, <clears throat> the, the current education, the education minister has described uh, indigenous content as a fad so there's a struggle even to get indigenous history and contemporary life taught in k-12 schools so that gives you an idea of mm -hmm. you know the sort of and it's quite if you thought about economics you know there are communities who do provide an awful lot of of income to the uh, the province and to canada but it's never really acknowledged because the, the, the focus on the window was always placed on inadequacy and you know need and and so the yeah the the the, the in an equitable world there would be and should be more lobbying power but the system is still so weighted that you know it, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors from both provisional uh, provincial and um, uh, federal government when it comes to to addressing those those issues. Thank you, Harmeet. So uh, uh, I'm good. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say um, yes and no for me as well. I think um, people have been great at going to the media mm -hmm. and creating advocacy groups and committees to voice their concerns. And I think it was largely due to that that you know there has been some government action. Um, like last year, the government announced to assign 66% more staff to process um, spousal sponsorship applications. Um, however, there's still a backlog and it's going to take some time. Um, and Canada has already moved citizenship ceremonies and some of its other processes online. Again, I think there's a lot of work to still be done, um, but I don't think that um, this would be the case without the lobbying and without going to the media and without people sharing their stories. Um, I'm not very optimistic that the government going forward will be any more transparent about their plans beforehand. And um, I just see that being a continued um, issue going forward. Thank you. Um... Uh, why don't we open it up to the audience? If people got questions, raise your you hit the raise your hand function. Um, we do have one question from Melissa. Uh, would you say this is a security issue? Is this who is this uh, for, Melissa? All of them? 
Everyone. Okay. So one of the questions that comes up and in, in when we talk about the border uh, and when we talk about the pandemic is, is um, whether it's a security issue and then whether we define it, whether define it as a security issue that makes things better or worse. So um, I, I think the question is really is, is do you, have you seen the definition of the, of, of, of the pandemic in the border as a security issue? The reason why we asked this, or I think one of the reasons why Melissa is asking this is that the notion of closing the borders is to improve our security. But the reason why we're having this panel is, is that it may have improved some people's security, but it harmed other people's security. If you can't get your food and water, you know, uh, things because you're getting stopped at the border all the time, because all your food's on the other side of the border, that, that obviously impacts your security. Uh, that students who are in countries with less uh, freedom and more censorship, uh, you know, that the participation in schools, in school work here in, in, in Ottawa, or in Canada can threaten their security because their participation can lead them to being arrested. Uh, and so, uh, so I guess the, the question is, is how do you see the, the stuff that you've been talking about fit into the larger rubric of security and, and, and whether we should try to avoid that or embrace that? Starting again with Laura. I think if we look at um, specifically with the pandemic, I think when people think about security, they, they really are talking a lot about public health <laughs> measures that are in place. And I think uh, when we look at, uh, for example, uh, among temporary residents, if you had to complete a immigration medical exam to come to Canada as part of your application, your temporary resident visa was canceled if you were overseas and your, your medical exam had expired. So this was a clear signal mm -hmm. from the government that we were not going to make any accommodations in the public health space. We wanted to see, we wanted you to show up with a valid immigration medical exam that didn't even really address COVID or any of the other things that you would think of, but this from an optic standpoint was something that they really signaled was important during this time period. And then I think your point reflecting on um, how do we look at security and what does security mean for the individual population that we're talking about and whose security interests are we protecting in this space when you look at censorship, um, students not being able to undertake certain courses or even receive textbooks in the mail on certain topics, students were sharing that, you know, their textbook packages had been opened by uh, their border security and gone through and pages ripped out or, or textbooks fully missing from their course packages if the content was seen as being subversive. So I think when we look at security. I think this is a, a big word uh, that the government will like to beat their chest and, and show that they are making strides within this space to protect security of XYZ, whatever the public health or whatever the, the, the current um, landscape dictates. But I think for those of us that are practitioners in this space, we really see the, the inequity when it comes to how security is defined and how we look at who it impacts when and for how long afterwards to these, do these policy decisions impact uh, the security of folks well beyond just the initial position time frame. Okay, uh, Paul? Yeah, and this is, a, this is something that um, the digital security um, that many uh, Indigenous people around here have, have commented on that since that, you know, there's always been cultural insensitivity. There's always been um, harassment and, and to a certain extent bullying um, of indigenous people at the border, but the, it got worse after 9-11. You know, the 9-11, everything sort of changed in terms of, you know, even, even um, on border crossings that are literally almost slapped next to the, the reserve itself, some of the smaller ones like Chief Mountain border crossing. Um, and then that has also been extrapolated in terms of um, COVID as well. There was, um, I think the, the guy and I had an excess number of um, the vaccines. And so they set up, no, it wasn't. It was the Blackfoot, in, it was the Blackfeet in Montana in Browning. They had an excess set of um, number of vaccines. So they set up a free vaccine clinic just outside the border. And 
people were queuing up for like three, four hours. Some people were queuing up overnight from Alberta to go into Montana to get the vaccine. And the government shut it down. You know, that this is this is a security issue. And they actually cited security as an issue for it. Um, you know, that the it 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 created problems um with the border. Now, conversely though, when it comes to the border reopenings, though going back to that report in February, there was a lot of concern from indigenous communities about their security. You know, the province is saying, well, if we open the border, um, you know, that doesn't mean non-indigenous people can get onto your reserve. And the the communities are saying, well, you don't actually help us enforce, you know, you, you don't help, with, you know, we don't want um, RCMP on controlling our border reserves. We've been down that path, you know, many years ago. So the province doesn't provide any support to close or to maintain or to protect the reserve borders. So how are you going to, you know, how can you argue that non-Indigenous non people will stay away? Uh, and if you, if you go, you know, there are no trespass signs on the reserves around here. Um, and that is specifically relating to hunting and camping. You know, you need a license to hunt and camp on the reserve. It doesn't mean people cannot just drive through. There's nothing to stop. You know, we've seen how open reserves are. You can, you can be driving through a reserve without, but if you've missed the sign, you probably don't even realize you're on a reserve. And so there's been a lot of pushback from indigenous communities about their security in terms of the border being reopened while the Canadian government has talked about um, that you know, secure the drugs is quite often used as a you know, as an excuse as well. That we can't allow freedom for indigenous peoples to cross the back and forth on the borders because so many drug gangs infiltrate, um, you know, reserves and that's how they smuggle across. And so that's one of the excuses. You know, it's more commonly associated with the Mexican border, um, but it's a common motif sort of for this border too, in terms of. And COVID has, has enabled them to ramp that to the rhetoric up to a certain degree as well. And yet another blockade to, to indigenous freedom and movement. Thank you, Hamid. Um, I think I had kind of uh, touched on this, but a possible solution could have been for the government in terms of just temporary permanent residents um, to have honored expired permanent resident visas and let mm -hmm. them into the country, provided that they do abide by their you know, health care protocols. But of course, IRCC also needed to do inadmissibility checks again, like criminal records for certain individuals, um, because like I mentioned, some time had elapsed. Um, I understand that and I appreciate that, but I, I just hope that the government doesn't use that as a blanket statement to validate their slow processing times, um, lack of transparency, because people have been waiting for almost two years now. And so, I think the issues that people are facing right now um, go beyond security. And I don't think that can just be swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. I guess one of the questions that was being asked is, is are we to get to normal anytime soon? So we're, we're having this event the day after the border with the United States. The Americans opened their side of the border. The Canadians opened theirs a couple months ago. Um, so let's go in the reverse order. Harmi, do you see that the announcement yesterday or the de decision that took place yesterday changing things much that we're going to return to normalcy soon? Or do you find that there's going to continue to be pretty high barriers to movement going forward, but you know, beyond just the P insistence on P PCR tests, uh, which I've had to pay out of pocket a couple different times now? Yeah, um, thank you. I'm actually um, not very optimistic, um, just considering all the backlog and the applications and also just, you know, the COVID conditions across the world are unpredictable. I know Canada has a high vaccination rate compared to other countries, um, but we also have to look at um, other countries, third world countries, how they're accessing um, vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm a little bit skeptical um, due to that. And um, also just our weak economical conditions in Canada right now. You know, um, Canada is making these assertions that they're going to be increasing immigration and increasing um, the number of newcomers coming to Canada, um, which is great, but I just hope that there are resources in place to support these newcomers. And, um, I, and again, I think the common theme here has been transparency with the government and um, those waiting 
So um, uh, cautiously optimistic, I would say. <laughs> okay, uh, Paul. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I'm, you know, I've been in Canada now for, and it's so I, I got my permanent residence halfway through the lockdown. <laughs> um, <laughs> Congratulations. And we, yeah, yeah we, we'd, we'd applied to my, my wife's here as a well, I, I came on a, on a, a temporary worker um, permit. Uh, my wife came in on a international student. So we sort of you know, listened to both of your talks. And yeah, we, we sort of sat there and been through half of this stuff ourselves. Um, and then their visa expired and we drove, it was only a two hour drive from the border. We drove to the border to renew our student visa because that's where we'd done it all last time. And we got there and they said, oh, no, the website says you can't do it at the border, you got to do it online. And we're like, all right, the website says no such thing. Or if it was a really small print because we didn't find it. So then we went back home, um, started doing the process of her renewing her own visa. And then within a, sort of like two or three days of that, I got the notification we got permanent residence. So it's like, okay, thankful we don't have to do that anymore. Um, but still, you know, we still have not completely freed ourselves from from watching US news, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And so that you know, sort of was watching with interest as uh, a couple of weeks ago with Biden as, as um, you know, getting those ports in LA to run 24 hours a day, and, you know, in the hope of boosting goods and services. You know, at the same time, my mother-in-law said that, you know, they're being warned that the shops are going to be empty at Christmas. So if you buy any kids toys, you want to go get them now. Um, and so all of that, you know, there's, there's on you know, a personal level, I mean, a, Sort of getting very frustrated with my, my my daughter's school buses because they're not turning up half the time because there's driver shortages and so if the local busser doesn't have a driver your school bus can't find drivers. Where is the country finding drivers for all these goods and services, especially when there's so many of these restrictions and backlogs on immigration applications? Um, yeah, I think it's going to be probably a couple of years if I'm being optimistic. Mm -hmm. And then you're know, on a personal level of travel. When, when the border was shut down, I couldn't go back to England because I would have been a temporary worker. I wouldn't have been allowed back in at that point. But now I'm a permanent resident. Technically, I can. But I'm looking at Europe, and especially England. I don't want to go home. And so <laughs> it's, it's too risky. It's still, you know, the, the, especially the way the government there has handled, you know, just seems to have just decided to give up and whatever happens will happen. So, and that is going to have a knock-on effect, I think, mean, globally as well so i think that yeah to 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 to, to echo um how meet the the it's um cautiously optimistic but within a few years i think there's still too many moving parts um for anything to sort of fall back into place anytime soon speaking of caution as an academic who became a permanent resident in canada uh, I, I advise you to make sure that that your university processes your permanent paperwork, because I found out that I was supposed to be fired in my previous job because I went to the library and found out I was supposed to return my books very soon because the people who are supposed to process my new permanent resident paperwork, you know, didn't make it all the way through the university bureaucracy. And I would have only found out about it when I didn't get paid in August of that year. Wow. So, that, you know, they, they won't they probably won't notify you if it isn't processed. Uh, uh, or if it is, uh, you know, you'll find out. Yeah, you know, I hope they are because they, they they took my new so they took my new social insurance number, but I think I probably should double check. Yeah, <laughs> you should you should double check because you, you <laughs> just you. don't know. Uh, and I when I got my citizenship, I went through the same thing. I was like, did you process that? And like, no, we didn't. I'm like, mm, that's great. So, uh, Laura, uh, should we be optimistic or pessimistic about uh, changes in the near future? I think we also need to kind of grapple with as a, a country and, and probably globally, what we mean when we think of a return to normal. Um, I'm not sure that normal really worked <laughs> for a lot of <laughs> folks. And I think based on what we've discussed on our panel today, a lot of the pressure points that we highlighted that emerged during the border closures were simply just exacerbated ongoing cracks in the system and our the, the folks that we interact with more regularly were the first victims of this um, ongoing process. And so I think 
our border closures really did expose um, our priorities as a nation and how we delineated who was exempt and who could come through also really speaks to what we valued. You know, we wanted the economic drivers in the country, but we weren't as necessarily focused on the family and humanitarian and, and refugee relationships and, and, and foundations within our country as well. So I think we kind of have to grapple with that as we return to our normal when we look at, at this as well. And then I think any normal that we obtain is going to have to have mobility with some flexibility baked into it in some format as we grapple with vaccine inequity around the globe as we grapple with unknown variants that have yet to emerge. COVID is probably going to be one of, <laughs> you know, multiple pandemics or other challenges that we're going to have to face when we look at our borders. And so if the blueprint that we carved out this round is anything to look at, I think there's certainly a lot that we need to tackle before we even think about a return to normal uh, and what that could look like. Thank you. Um, I'm just going through the questions now. Uh, one specifically for Paul, which is consultations with Indigenous nations doesn't go well with the government of Canada. Uh, is there something that, you know, is there, do you have a good reason why the government of Canada keeps on messaging these things up and whether there's a learning process that could, that they could go through? I could be here all day with that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, part of the process goes, you know, um, to the on a slightly larger theoretical level of the processes of settler colonialism were meant to have the point where indigenous people no longer existed. All those policies and you know, in the history that we've looked at for Canada, for United States, you know, the, the treaties were never meant to 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 still be in existence. They were stop gaps to get what was needed at the time. At some point, you know, assimilation is in process. Sign this treaty while the the Indian Act already exists. Oh, look, now you've signed a treaty, you're subject to this. Um, and so there's a, there's a, I think a resentment from governments um, that they have to deal with indigenous people still. And there's, you know, the, the United Nations, you know, we talk about the Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And even that doesn't go far enough in that it's still, it puts the power really or the responsibility with settler nations. So, so it's still this, this idea of domestic uh, dependency that most governments, Canada, the United States, really don't, would like not to have to deal with anymore. Um, you know, there are still resources that are st <laughs> on indigenous land. It's sort of, anyway, and it's, it's constantly complicated by, you know, I think that the 2014, um, Again, the Canada, Canada Supreme Court argued in the Shilcotton case that um, Indigenous um, title to land has never been ceded. But in the same Supreme Court decision, where that would suggest a stronger protection of rights to land, the same Supreme Court decision actually made it easier for provinces to interfere with that sovereignty. You know, so there's sort of this legal, by the highest court in Canada, implicitly you know, acknowledging indigenous sovereignty, and then sort of the same sort of time trying to strip it. I would say provinces now, you know, for things like uh, pipelines, provinces can argue, um, you know, the greater good sort of sort of thing overrides indigenous sovereignty, and so I think there is still very much a legal and an intellectual and a procedural attitude that indigenous people are in the way. Um, and so whenever indigenous people come and say, you know, we demand the right to, to, to fair treatment on, on our land. We demand the right to, to uh, control our own resources. We demand the right to um, you know, negotiate you know, our, own, our own business deals. Um, it's 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 seen as a, a an imposition upon the federal government. You know, sort of a case in point is that, that you know in the U.S. 1922, the the Supreme Court argued that 
indigenous people have the right to water on their land, the Winters Doctrine. Um, <clears throat> now in Montana, a few years back, um, the Salish Kootenai wanted to buy back the dam on the river in the territory, in the reservation. And Montana um, senators and politicians actually stood up in government complaining that this had to be stopped because the uh, Al-Qaeda were infiltrating the tribe and they were going to use it as a way to overthrow the United States. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's this weird, I don't know, sort of paranoia about recognizing indigenous rights to land, rights to resources, rights to, you know, the places where we live. There's this constant sort of paranoia that, that they're going to kick us all out of the country. Um, but, you know, we, we had with um, uh, when the declaration, you know, the, the Canada was one of the four countries that refused to acknowledge UNDRIP when it first came out. And, you know, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, all four countries refused to acknowledge it. Canada and the United States eventually said, OK, it's a workable, it's a workable, it's an aspirational document, you know, but then turned around and said, there's no way that these, this could be implemented into Canadian law. You know, which really just means it'd be too much work and too much effort and too much time to implement it in Canadian law. As someone pointed out about you know, a comment about student debt cancellation the other day, someone pointed out, yeah, we've just all sat there and decided two, 3 a.m. is actually 2 a.m. You know, if we can do that, we can do anything. We can regulate time, we can do anything. So there's no reason indigenous legal systems can't be part of the Canadian legal system, apart from the fact they don't want to do it. And so I think it's a very long-winded answer to a short, I think, did they, yeah, there's still too much resentment at the federal level of indigenous people still actually existing and still maintaining their sovereignty because the grand experiment was they weren't supposed to be around anymore. Well, thank you. I, the depressing answer, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, one that I think captures things quite well. Um, are there any other questions from the audience or do any of the panelists have any questions for each other? Uh, In that case, I, I want to thank uh, Rachel Wallace and Paxton Mayer for organizing this event. I want to thank Stephanie Bois of, of um, the Faculty of Public Affairs for doing a lot of the heavy lifting of, of, of uh, registrations and, 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 and publicity. Uh, and, and of course, Melissa Jennings and Kaha uh, Haji Muhammad from uh, the Center for Security Intelligence and Defense Studies for their help in organizing the event. And most of all, I want to thank Laura, Harmit, and Paul for their expertise and their time. Uh, I, I definitely learned a lot in the course of this conversation. Uh, and uh, I think that even if the government of Canada can't learn, <laughs> we certainly can. And since we are voters and we do have voices out on Twitter and elsewhere, we can put pressure on the government because the government does respond slowly sometimes, but they sometimes do respond when there's enough an outcry. Uh, so we'll keep pushing on these issues, and I want to thank you again for, for your expertise. So thank you very much, Laura, Paul, and Harmeet, for your time and, and your views on all this stuff. Thank you again for inviting us. Yeah, thank you for having me on this panel. It was great. Thank you. All right. Agreed. Wonderful. Thank you. Right, take, take care. Good luck managing the rest of this pandemic and <laughs> all that sort of craziness. <laughs>